to a Thursday edition of Cleveland Browns Daily. I'm Jason Gibbs. That's right. When the boys are away, the men will play. That's right. You know, that we, is correct. We, we're taking care of it. Poizel, I'm working on your levels here. I'm running my own board. We're hosting. We're doing all kinds of shenanigans. How about now? Is this better, Gibbs? There we go. We are because. Right. <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. Oh, yeah. We're doing all right now. All right. We welcome you into a Thursday edition of Cleveland Browns Daily. I'm Jason Gibbs. He is the esteemed staff writer for your Cleveland Browns, Anthony Poizel. We are with you for hour one. And then coming up in hour two, uh, you're going to hear from a few luminaries. Nathan Zagura's exclusive one-on-one with new Brown safety Juan Thornhill. Also, Nathan sit down with the great Charles Davis from CBS Sports and NFL Network. So looking forward to that. Plus, we'll have a little fun in hour two as well. We're going to have a little fun here in hour one uh, as we as we get through this offseason and we continue. We're a few weeks away from the players being back in the building, boys. Out. Yeah. Less Crazy. than 30 days. Man, does that time go by fast? Uh, and once this starts, then – it's it's on. I mean, yeah. it's it's there's there's stuff going on every single week from then on, on until training camp. Um, you know, the practices and and more media availability again and you know, we we'll have a lot to talk about. Uh this will be the first chance to or second chance really after the introductory Zoom calls to talk with all the all the new free agents and and you know, we had we had a lot of them. I think it, it's at it's at 10 right now. Uh new players that we've added. So, um yeah, it'll be a busy time and it's starting up very soon. And then and then we got the draft, which that's a weekend of its own. So. Yeah, I mean, you have the draft, and then we go right into OTAs, uh, a mini camp that's going to end early. That's right, yep. Because of us having to report earlier. Mm-hmm. So peek behind the curtains, usually we get the 4th of July week off. I think that we're going to get that still. We'll but see. when we come back, Poizel. Uh, it's training camp. I'll see you in January. Yeah, is what I tell my wife. Exactly. You got to make that week is even more, <laughs> even more important for us now. I hope I hope everybody is able to get a good vacation and get you know yes. get out of Cleveland for a little bit if you can. Go to the beach, relax because when you get back, it's and and this is not even for just us. Obviously, this yeah. is for the players and everybody too. Those those five weeks that they have are super important for just refreshing, recharging mentally, physically, and getting ready because as soon as we get off the plane or as soon as we get back in the building. Uh, after that week, it is going to be, it's it's going to be all out from then on until January, like you said. Maybe the longest preseason and training camp <laughs> period in the uh, this will be year eleven for me that I've had to deal with, and I know that you've had to deal with mm-hmm. uh, four preseason games. Thanks, Hoff, going into the Hall of Fame. Now yeah. we got to report early. Yeah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, you know. We essentially have three road games a week in Philly. Right, cheese steaks every God, night. I forgot that it was it was you get a you get a week in oh, Philly too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's oh, joint yeah, practices, buddy. but the joint practices are fun. I think that's gonna be that's gonna be the 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 best most entertaining period of training camp because I mean, this last year and we've had joint practices now the last two years, but you know, whenever you can get into that training camp setting and go against another team, you just you learn so much more about your team and 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 you see. You know, players are, are just pushing harder, and just you just learn more about about how the team is going to be, who's who's uh, you know, who's could be in for a breakout year, who's going to look good. So, um, those joint practices are, are going to be, I think, the highlight of, of of training camp for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, you want to know where you're at. I mean, here's the runner ups to the Super Bowl. I know that they've had a lot of changes. Yeah. I still remember the first time they walked in mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. last year, and we were all like. Those are some very large individuals. Right. And not just uh, large, too. Good individuals. Good, large, fast, the complete package. Yeah, they, and those were the Philadelphia Eagles. They gave year. us a hard time in those practices, That's <laughs> to, to say the least. <laughs> I feel like we had a couple good moments early, and we yeah. were like, all right, feeling pretty good. Mm-hmm. And then it just went downhill. Yeah, I just I remember the red zone drills and 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 particularly just toward the end of, of those practices. It was like, all right, they, they, they got some good receivers. Jalen Hurts was looking yeah, solid. Jalen Hurts actually looks like he's supposed to look. Yeah, uh, AJ Brown had uh, some really really good catches. <laughs> like he was the highlight of, of of those few days for sure. It was and yeah. and guess what? It was a good like just like I was saying. It was a good preview of of what was to come for the season, both for the Eagles as far as where they were, and then in in, in some degrees where where the Browns end up being. So that's why it's an, it's 
those joint practices are valuable. Um, I think more teams are trying to look to do those now, and, and it's wise. Uh, if you can maintain injuries and, and, and you know, uh, a lot snaps properly through that time and, and leading up to that, then you're going to learn a lot about your team. Yeah. Well, we're with you today. We're take, If you have questions for one Anthony Poizel and myself, you can tweet them to us at Browns underscore daily. Uh, first and foremost, on today's show, uh, we would be remiss if we did not wish our GM – I know he's not listening right now. He's probably a little busy doing some other things, uh, <laughs> especially because it's everybody Everybody that went to Arizona. I feel like this is the first day back in the building for everybody that went yeah. to the owners' meetings. Everybody's back here today. Uh, Andrew Barry has a birthday today, so please make sure you wish wish him a happy birthday. He's turning 36 if, if my machine. Google search is correct. 36? Yes. Still plays a mean flag football game. Absolutely, without yes, a doubt. Yes, he does. <laughs> He's in. He's he's not far removed from his prime there. That's for sure. No, not at all. So we want to wish him a happy birthday. As I mentioned, with everybody back in the building, we have a few more signings. Uh, you know, Anthony Walker Jr., who was awesome yesterday, signed his contract uh, yesterday. But today, the Browns taking care of an offensive lineman that was rumored to be coming here. Uh, they officially signed guard Wes Martin. Martin entering his fifth NFL season out of Indiana. Originally a fourth-round pick by Washington in 2019. Martin has appeared in 38 games with 11 starts. Last season, he appeared in six games as a reserve. Uh, Martin, a native of West Milton, Ohio, attended Milton Union High School, a close proximity school to one of my good friends who oh. was from Southern Ohio, okay. Cole Condon. Yeah, near the, Dayton, uh, right? The shooting legend. Yeah, it's it's near Dayton, West Milton. Yes. Yeah, small town. I was looking it up earlier. Correct. But uh, yeah. So kind of a homecoming, uh, and, and a, a signing to give us a little depth on that inside offensive line. Yeah, exactly. That's that's all it is for. Is is I think the Browns kind of view him as maybe the guy who's replacing that that depth spot that was left over from Yelder Froholt. Um, you know, that was a need that they needed to fill Where with. Yelled to end up signing Cardinals. That's right. He's in Arizona now. That's right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he's got starting experience. After he just has any NFL experience is what you want uh, for, for your reserve guard and a guy that, you know, could play left guard or right guard in a pinch if needed. Um, I don't think the Browns are necessarily done adding offensive line depth uh, over the course of, you know, these next few weeks of free agency and agree. obviously the draft. But he's uh, he, he, he still fills one of the needs that was a little further down the list this offseason of getting guard depth and um, – yeah, he's he's got experience, and that's that's all that you could really can ask for with with guard depth. Right yeah, I, I would say from a from an offensive line standpoint, maybe you need to go out and get another tackle. Yeah, I I mean Whether it's through the draft exactly. or you yeah. know another free agent, right? Because free agent because Chris Hubbard now an unrestricted free agent. He was the guy that you had as as a swing tackle before. They still definitely definitely a need. I, I think that's a position that they could potentially target. It's early in our draft picks, but it's actually going to be mid-round picks now uh, where we start jumping in. But I think that's a position that they probably could target early in the draft because they, you know, it's it's never a bad thing to have young tackles on your roster who um, can, can jump in in a pinch. And, and uh, that's still that's still a need that they need. So, yeah, you need to check off their list. Yeah, I- indeed. And But, again, it, it, you're bringing in guys, you're creating competition. That's what the, that's what the front office wants. Yeah. That's what the, uh, the coaching staff wants. So – all right, speaking of that, then CBS Sports says the biggest need for the Browns still is a defensive tackle with linebacker a close second. Mm-hmm. Uh, agree or disagree on that, Poizel, and your top three needs for the Browns to fill before training camp. No, I, I would agree, and you know, I, I think they've done a pretty good job so far of, of finding starters in the places where they needed new starters, right? They got Dalvin Tomlinson. Fill one of those needs at, at defensive tackle as a starter. Uh, they got Juan Thornhill at safety. Now they found their speedy receiver in Elijah Moore. I would still put defensive tackle though at the top of the list. So I agree. Um, I just I don't think you can bank on Jordan Elliott or, or Tommy Togiai being your week one starter, and that that's what it, it, it would look like right now. And I don't think you can also bank on on Perion becoming a starter to start the season. Not to say that he won't be capable of that role as he goes through you know year two. Um, obviously they're hoping he's able to take a big push this year but you still I think need to find somebody else and there's a still uh, you know some some good guys who are out there uh, that they can sign and probably get for cheap on, on a one-year well, deal and you're going to have more money freed up 
Is it after June 1st with the JJ3 and the Clowney exactly. releases? Yeah, so it might be a while until we figure out who that next defensive tackle starter would be. If it's, I mean, I just I think they 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 do need to add somebody else there. Uh, you can't if you really want to go all out on fixing the run defense and fixing all the issues that happened with your interior last year. You got to add at least one more top tier. Uh, I shouldn't say top tier, but. You know, you got to add one more stable defensive tackle who can start games for you and, and, get, and get the guy. job done. Yeah, sure. Um, and hopefully, again, you know, you want Perry on uh, one of the young young guys from last year in that room to, to take a step up this year. Um, but you still got to have a backup plan in case he's just not ready yet. And that's why they need to sign somebody. Now, to go to the second need, uh, I would also say it was linebacker. I've been thinking. Really? Well, of course, not yeah. defensive end? No, I, because I, 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 like, I like Oboe a lot. Uh, I think he, I think he'll be able to get the job done. You saw what he did with eight games as a starter last year, and I think they're going to give him a chance to, to be a, a full 16, 17 game starter. Now, to to say that that's still not a need, no, I, I think they still need more depth there. But I, I don't know if that trumps the need that you have at linebacker, which is I think trying to find another starting caliber player uh, to pair with with Anthony Walker. Um, I mean, you, you, that it, room got hit so hard by injuries last year, but but even then it was still you know a little inconsistent at times um and i think it, it, it would help if you had another veteran guy in that room who you know you pair him with a walk jok um and then you still have jacob phillips and sioni takitaki in rotation role i think that's about as good of a linebacker role as you, uh, room as you can get uh it, it, the run defense gives i mean it was just it was so bad last year like it's just so Correct. bad and and if you really want to try and patch that up i think you need to prioritize defensive tackle linebacker the rest of the way Again, not saying I would put defensive end third on this list here. Um, not to say that they don't need to get another defensive end, but I, I like I, I think like you just need a little more depth. And, and yeah. it's you know I mean you've got Alex Wright uh, a defensive end. You got Isaiah Thomas back yeah. there and Sam Kamara, mm -hmm. uh, but like Miles and, and Ogbo. Uh, I mean you, you hope that you know everybody stays healthy, but you're one injury away from right. I mean you saw last year like look. JOK hasn't played a full 17 games yet uh, in his career, right? Like, injuries are going to happen at some point at, at both of those positions. And to me, you saw what happened at linebacker last year. I mean, injuries obviously hit that room harder than any other position on the team. But you saw what happened in that room and what it meant for your defense last year when guys went down with injuries. And if, if you want to make sure that – because, look, injuries are going to happen again. It's, it's just – it's inevitable in <laughs> – it's inevitable in the sport. And uh, you saw what happened to the interior defense when, when – guys started going down so yeah. get another veteran in there um well you've got walker coming back from a serious injury i mean taki taki tore his acl mm -hmm. in december yeah if i'm correct right so like, he, that's he, i don't know when his right. timetable is for yeah. him coming back i guess he is on track to otherwise they wouldn't have signed him to a new contract right <laughs> right so he's on track to come back but you know it's an acl injury yeah it, sometimes it takes two years to get your legs back exactly i just and and even still, that that was a position that needed to be better last year. Um, Anthony Walker going down was a huge loss, but it was still a position that needed to be needed to be better. And and if you want this defense to really take that next step, I think you still need to find another linebacker who you can rely on to take the majority of snaps in games. And not not need to, doesn't need to be a guy in every down linebacker, somebody who you can trust as a tackler, and, and get the job done. Because you know. With what Jim Schwartz wants to do with the defensive line, like th they'll be able to take care of business too, and that'll be better. If the defensive line's better, then the linebackers are going to be playing better too, most likely. So um, it doesn't need to be super flashy, but it is still, I think, a, a top need that they need to find a way well, to, to, to patch. And you look at things like I would think it's a make-or-break year for Jordan Elliott. Absolutely. I think Maybe. Jacob Phillips. Absolutely, like, yeah. And, and Jacob oh. Phillips was flashed. I mean, you got to be on the field, though. Any guy from that – that 2021, 2020, yeah. especially it's 2021 draft class. This is this is when you need to see them take a big step. And I don't know if you can say with confidence right now that Jacob Phillips will be able to do that. He's also been somebody, unfortunately, who has dealt with his, his fair share of injuries. He's a he's a great guy, and we've seen him make some 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 nice plays over the years. But um, you just can't afford again. You just can't afford to have guys going down hurt in, in that room again. And and what that means for your defense. You saw it last year, and it didn't it didn't look pretty. Well. It, the other, the other room that I think we're not talking about a whole lot, but and you're going to hear from Juan Thornhill coming up at 2 o'clock in an exclusive CBD interview with Nathan Zagura. Uh, but you've got Thornhill, you've got Grant Delpit, you've got DeAnthony Bell. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go get another body or two. Yeah, I mean, and I that, think – That could be a draft 
uh, day t- day two, day three type deal. I mean, I I think it's well within reason that maybe that's a, the position that they go for in round three with their first pick now, uh, number seventy four overall. You know, I, I again injuries they they had a, I'd say good injury luck <laughs> on that side. I mean, they, they, John Johnson stayed healthy. Grant Delpit stayed healthy all year. Yeah. Uh, but that's not... Grant's got to play better. Exactly. He, he does. And he, and he ended the season on a good note. He did. He played really well down there. Which course. is encouraging. But now he, now the thing with him is you got to keep it up for, for 17 games. And that's what they're, I think they're banking on. Um, you know, I think Juan Thornhill was going to be a, a really good addition to this defense. But again, like, you got to prepare for injuries. I think you need more depth. There's only, like you said, there's only D'Anthony Bell... Uh, on the roster and he might he, you know they gave him snaps uh, toward the end of the year to see what he can do but y- i think it, you need to add another young guy in that room and that's why i think it's safety is well within play uh, of of that that round three that first pick in round three um yeah all right so who is there a top need still on the offensive side of the football because we've uh, talked defense yeah. everything's been i mean defense i guess it really all depends on what they think of of jerome ford you know because kareem hunt is, is the one uh, big, like biggest player on that side of the ball who who they lost in, you know they're going to lose in free agency and uh I just if they have a lot of confidence in Jerome Ford and that he can you know AB a- a- did John Kelly's back Yeah yeah showed a little bit Yeah I mean I mean uh, you're throwing him into the fire It was it was noteworthy to me how uh I, I think it is in his end of season press conference or, or one of the times he's talked after the season that Andrew Berry said that you know he was really intrigued by Jerome Ford's uh pass catching abilities and that to me was a little bit of a hint of like, okay, maybe they don't look to bring in another running back, like a, a high caliber running back to kind of replace what they had with Kareem Hunt. Maybe they think Jerome Ford can be that guy. You know, it's not like he'll he could still be the kick returner, but it's not like he'll be needed on kick returner, especially if he's like they have they're gonna have guys who can be kick returner now too. They, and Jerome Ford looked really good as a kick returner. You know, he's he's good with the ball in his hands, and so I think they're gonna give him a bigger opportunity to um, to kind of take absorb some of the. The, the leftover work that, that could be left over by not having Kareem Hunt on your roster. So I, I, w- I guess I would say running back if 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 Jerome if they don't think it like that for Jerome Ford, but um, more offensive line depth. And I wouldn't I wouldn't even rule receiver out of the question either. You know, you can never have enough wide receivers. No, you can't. Let, and, and then let the best ones play. Right. And there's a lot on the roster right now. There's 12 on the roster right now. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, but if there's guys out there that you think can you know, have a good training camp, land on your team, or, or make an impact during the season. Like, there's still a few good receivers out there. Uh, you are clearly going to be throwing the ball a lot more in 2023 right. than you have in past years. Right. You yeah. can't have enough weapons. And I like I like the Elijah Moore trade. I like the Marquise Goodwin signing. I think that's going to really, really help the pass game a lot. But uh, y- like you keep saying, you just can't have enough receivers. If there's some, if there's somebody else good out there I, that comes at the right deal, you got to take it. So. You know. It, at first thought when I'm going through things, I'm like, I could use another tight end. But I'm like, no, I yeah. think we're going to one tight end. Mm-hmm. And and you forget, lost in the shuffle of everything, was the signing of Jordan Akins. Yeah. It, who was a touchdown machine in Houston. Yeah. You use the term loosely, but right. yeah. Touchdown machine for five touchdowns, yeah. Well, that <laughs> – yeah, but I mean, look, he led. Unfortunately, the, he that's... he led the Texans with in touchdowns. So, yeah. and it's like if they had a, a if they had their quarterback situation figured out, if they were slightly better offensive team, would he have had more? Like, you know, I, I thought it was interesting too. One of the things that Andrew Barry said uh, at the annual meetings this week when we were talking about Aikens was, you know, they they did not. He said they didn't seek uh, input from Deshaun Watson, who played with Aikens in sure. 2018 and 2019. He didn't look to ask Watson what he thought of him it was just you know our 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 crew here thought that he was a talented player he had a good year he make he's, he was a playmaker for the Texans last year and we thought that he'd be a good addition to the offense it really had nothing to do with his you know familiarity with Deshaun although who knows I mean maybe that'll really help them a lot I, I don't know I don't know how close they were in their time together I know um I forget who the other tight end was that the Texans had but he, you know Aikens wasn't the top tight end at the time um but it, it can't hurt right like you, you know, you no. pair, pair up a guy with another really talented quarterback again, there's there's a lot of good things that can happen there. So um, so I like that signing too. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know what that means for, for Harrison Bryant. I think, you know, he'll be more in a, in a depth role this year, but um, I, I wouldn't put tight end. <laughs> I wouldn't put tight end as a need. I, I think I think they're set there. Maybe maybe they look to add like another, you know, a, a fourth player, or fourth or fifth player to that room just to for training camp competition. Um, but I, I like what they have. I think I think Najoku 
you know. Can yeah. But like again, guys suffer injuries, and if you get exactly. a tight end that goes down, you know, Joku, on God forbid, mm-hmm. he goes down for a game or two. Yeah, you got to have someone to step right in. Well, well that's why got I, a couple guys that can do that now, and that's why they got Aikens too. I think because Joku did go down for a few games last year, correct? And, and there wasn't a, a whole lot of production that that came came from Harrison Bryant. So, uh, yeah, I like the I like the Aikens sign a lot. I think that has the potential to be sort of a. a I don't want to call it an under the radar signing, but something that you look back on, and you're like, okay, we didn't, that, that didn't seem like as big of a deal at the time, but you know, if Akins has a, another five touchdown year, that's great. Like, yeah, that that would have slotted him very highly on our list of. I think yes, it would have made him absolutely. second touchdowns last year for us. So, <laughs> we'll we'll get into more uh, on the free agency front and and get Poizal's favorite signings, best in, uh, guy that can make the biggest impact the quickest. Uh, we'll get to that here in just a few minutes. Want to wish everybody a happy MLB opening day and wish our friends at the Guardians all the best here in 2023. Opening on the West Coast, 10 yeah. 10 first pitch. Not ideal for my sleep schedule, which is already a mess this week. Uh, Shane Bieber taking the mound for the Guardians. Uh, wish them all the best of luck. I'd love to see the MLB season start like in mid-April yeah I mean I think opening day should be a national holiday that's just me and I know it's never but gonna like happen. half the teams don't open at home though it, well yeah but it's still I mean if you're not open at home you're still putting them on the TV like I don't know I just that's when there's opening day it's just a, it, it feels like the start of spring it feels like maybe not like a national holiday in a sense that like people don't have to go to work or anything like that but like let's make it like a nice relaxed day people want to watch their baseball uh people want to watch people I know here people want to watch their guardians because it's a young, talented team, and they, they got a chance to make some noise. Well, and I would, I was thinking about this. I'm like, why couldn't this game be at at, at four o'clock today, like one o'clock yeah. Seattle time? Like, you know, why don't they play during the day? Right. Why are they waiting till seven o'clock at night to open their season? It's a great question. And I was looking at the schedule too. I'm like, are there any other East Coast teams that are on the West Coast for opening day? It just feels not fair for. I mean, I know it's it's one out of one sixty two. There's I mean, a lot the of baseball. I mean, the Giants are at the Yankees. That's going on actually right now. Yeah, but that's that's a West Coast team yeah. coming to the East Coast. It's I mean, gosh, like watching opening day at ten a.m. probably isn't a bad deal, <laughs> right? No, I, I mean, and, and the West Coast teams that are playing are playing the other West Coast teams: Rockies, Padres, Angels, Athletics, yeah, exactly, Diamondbacks, yeah. Dodgers. Yeah, and that's how it, I think that's how it should be. Like, make the the mountain time make the the, the central time teams yeah, do be a little you know, solid here. yeah 10 10 you make forcing people on the east coast to stay at 10 10 to watch their team is is it's a little harsh a little harsh boy is it all right we'll get our first time out in nick paulus is back in the studios he'll join us coming up uh at the well closer to 140 as we play a little fact or fiction uh more uh on free agency and we'll get poisal's thoughts on the nfl owner meetings because well he was in arizona Leave, let, he was living his best life. We'll get time. to that. I, yeah, it sure kind of looked that way. All right, we're back with more of Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by BallyBet. Coming up in just moments, you're listening to 850 ESPN Cleveland.
be able to, to you know, burn past some guys and, and give him an opportunity to make some deeper completions. Um, but then beyond that, like just when you have a guy like that who, who a defense has to be mindful of every time he's on the field, uh, you're, you're going to create even more space for guys like Amari, Donovan Peoples-Jones in the middle of the field for those, those kind of medium distance uh, side passes. Um, that's going to open up more space for them. The safeties are going to be occupied with Elijah. And, you know, guys like Amari Cooper and Donovan Peoples-Jones are going to benefit from having Elijah Moore in that offense as well now. And, and you know, this is, this, is, this is what they needed. This was easily – I, I would have put, honestly, getting a speedy receiver um, right there with, with defensive tackle and finding, you know, the top need. Uh, for, for what they needed to accomplish this year. And, and they got it. And they got it, I think, for a really good price. I mean, to be able to get a third-round pick back for them, too, is, is excellent. I, I think that that was an A-plus deal by Andrew Barry. And I'm really excited about what Elijah Moore is going to be able to do in this offense and what it means for Deshaun and, and, the, and all the other receivers. That's why I think he's going to be able to help the most. All right. Let's switch our attention to the owners' meetings. You spent some quality time in the sun, in the pool, hiking Camelback Mountain. Oh, yeah. uh, rubbing elbows with the big wigs of the big wigs in the National <laughs> Football League every night uh-huh. uh, at the Biltmore in, Ar- in Arizona, which is a fantastic hotel. Uh, your biggest takeaways, you know, Kevin Stefanski, uh, Andrew Barry talked Sunday night, Stefanski talked Monday, uh, and I believe the Haslam's talked Monday night. Am I correct on there? Tuesday morning? Uh, they, they spoke on, it was Monday, Tuesday. Okay. Tuesday I was on a plane the whole day. It was long, Not so long great. travel day. Not so great. But it was, it but was fine. It's, a, a lot going on, though. I mean, the, oh, yeah. the, the, the top people in this organization and in yep. this franchise uh, talk to the media, and they talk to the media for a long time, 25, right. 30 mm-hmm. minutes, 35 minutes. Yeah, I mean, the annual meetings are important, and I, I don't think I've appreciated how important the annual meetings are until I started working here. Um, but, you know, when you're able to get everybody and everybody in the league, all the GM's owners, coaches, they're all in one place at the same time, and for them it's almost like a mini vacation, right, because they're, they're always in a – a relatively nice part of the country uh, in a nice part of that nice part of the country. And they are able to, you know, just meet, hang out. Um, they have some fun. They do stuff beyond just, uh, you know, uh, going to meetings and stuff. It, it's, it's beyond that. They take their families for, for vacations too. So, but it, no, it's a great setting. Um, I'd say my takeaways uh, from what we heard from, you know, Stefanski, AB, and then I'll get to, to you know, anything that the Haslam said later too. But, you know, they just I'll just pick up right where I left off talking about Elijah Moore, Marquise Goodwin, the two the, the two big, uh, you know, additions that they were able to kind of lock in last week. Um, just more Elijah Moore. The thing that I got from Spansky I thought was interesting was he's a guy that, that it's, it's, he's not going to just be used in the slot. You know, I think if you look at how Elijah Moore had historically been used both his first two years in the NFL and obviously at Ole Miss was that he was a big slot guy. Um, I thought it was interesting that Savansky said, you know, he's we're not going to just limit him to the slot. Like we do want him to still help us out outside, uh, and not he's probably still going to play a lot in the slot. That's where he's just made his money when he was at Ole Miss. That's primarily where he worked from, and you know he was still able to to burn guys in the middle of the field, and that's going to be a really big weapon if, if they're able to kind of unleash that again from Elijah Moore uh, in this offense. But um, you know you're not going to see him just penciled in on the inside all the time, and. I think I like that. Like that, that you know, they want to take full. Uh, they want to maximize all the traits that he brings, and and specifically all the uh, traits that his speed brings. Um, and he's got good hands too. I think it's, it's he's only got like three career drops. It's you know he's got a reliable pair of hands that I, I think is really going to help this team. And Stefanski wants them to to you know use it in every way that he can, and I like that. So um, next point I had was just uh, with uh, they talked a little bit about Jed Wills, and um, obviously. You've got a big, big decision coming up with him uh, with, a, with the fifth-year option. But, you know, they said that they thought um, he had the best year of his career last year. And I know, yeah, I know it was, there were some times where it wasn't, it wasn't perfect. <laughs> no. It wasn't perfect. But the fact that they were willing to, you know, come out and say that about him, um, I think can also be a little bit of a hint of where they're thinking for that fifth-year option, which seems to suggest that uh, it, it's, it's pretty likely that, that they'll pick that up. So we'll – Obviously, we, they've got time to decide. We'll see. But they apparently liked what they saw out of Jed Wills last year. Yeah. Uh, Jed, Jed's another guy that he's from that 2020 draft class. Mm-hmm. Got to step up. Oh, I mean. Like, he, yeah. he's played well. But for us to take the next step as an organization, everybody's got to step up. Right. And, and he is not immune to that. And I think the key with Jed this year, and, and we've we've talked about this a lot with just the transition that the offensive lineman had to make in the middle of last year, going from Jacoby 
to Deshaun. Jacoby, obviously, not as mobile. Um, Deshaun able to improvise, make plays uh, if the pocket breaks down. You know, that, that's a big adjustment for the offensive lineman, too, to make. They're, you know, they they, they got to learn to to not stop their role in the play. Uh, they they got to keep plays going, too. As, you know, when Deshaun rolls out, they've got to still – still be blocking <laughs> and I think that's that's part of the reason where you know maybe Jed was a little bit inconsistent but that you know it was it, it was an adjustment for all of the offensive linemen correct and uh, yeah and I, I don't think we we don't talk enough about that but yeah two very different quarterback styles yeah and I mean that was always going to be a hard transition for the offensive line to make in the middle of the year I I know personally I I wasn't surprised that it, it, it took that you know took that's full six games really for them to kind of, I mean, it was never really fully consistent with them when Deshaun got in, I feel like. Um, but that's where it's going to help to just have a full off season this year. You know, these guys have experience now. Like th- has Joel, did Joel ever, Batonio, like did he ever really play consistently with a quarterback as mobile as Deshaun? I, no. No. <laughs> right. No. So even for guys like him, it was going to be a little bit of an <laughs> adjustment. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um so yeah, I I think it's it'll be better for the offensive line this year, and it needs to be better uh, for Jed Wilson. Even though they said that they thought he had the best year of his career last year, they've you know they I think they want to still see a little bit more of him, um, and 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 make sure that he ensures that a fifth year option is, is the right move. Indeed, uh, going to be th- there's some underlying stories as we get closer to camp that are worth watching. You know, will they will they redo some uh, some more of these contracts? It's a lot of money being paid to a, to uh, a small amount of people, and uh, you know if there's uh, if there's a big fish out there to still go get, mm-hmm. are you, are you going to have to restructure some more contracts? So there's something to watch yeah. there, there with with Jedrick Wills and, and that fifth year option. That, that's something to watch as well. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else that really stood out to you from the owners' meetings, especially uh, anything from Jimmy and D Haslam? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they talked a lot about where things are at with with the stadium and what it's sort a of a head there it is a very hot topic um they did say that it, it it doesn't look like there there will be a dome uh their main focus is on renovating first energy stadium kind of m- meshing that more into the redevelopments that the city of cleveland and mayor justin bibb right now are trying to make as far as uh, redeveloping that waterfront area um and unf- uh, you know, i know a lot of fans <laughs> really want a dome i know i I've been to a lot of more of the new dome stadiums around the league, and I like them a lot. Um, but it just seems like that's not uh, something that's in the cards for for this round of renovations. But obviously, it's still top of mind for them that they 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 want to make that a better place for fans and a better place to play football um, and a better area. Hey, absolutely. There's, I mean, gosh, the like, lakefront still needs work. I you mean, got a beautiful piece of property, and ex- and that's what they we were saying is work. is you know they. They uh, they know how much uh, opportunity is there if you're able to build, you know, nice things around the lakefront. That yep. it's going to make Cleveland a more attractive city. As it, you know, it's more community spaces, better better buildings, a better stadium. Of course, uh, it's it's going to really it would make Cleveland pop a lot more. And so I, I it seems like the direction is not to be let's build a stadium in a new piece of land around Cleveland. It's not let's build a new stadium that's going to have a dome and a new piece of land around Cleveland. It's going to be, what can we do with the property that we already own by the lake to make that stadium better? Now, the thing that I keep thinking in my mind of like, maybe this is the direction that they can go with this is, you know, you look at what they did in Miami uh, to that stadium a few years back. And I don't know how logistically, how much you can compare what the Browns could do to first thing you see and compare to what the Dolphins did at, at Hard Rock Stadium. But, you know, the Dolphins over the course of, I think, three, four or five years, renovated that entire stadium used to host both base both baseball and football it was not a great stadium it had no shade for fans and <laughs> it was terrible <laughs> and and then they renovated it to make it uh, you know uh, one of the uh, a gem of an outdoor stadium um still outdoors but you know they put a, the, the shades on top it was it, it's a more a more attractive place for everything and now they're hosting formula one events they they host you know the super bowl they they host all kind of other different events there and I wonder if that's something that, you know, that that they could do in Cleveland. I know it's obviously a lot different of a climate, but over the course of three, four, five years, slowly kind of get those renovations in. The stadium will look weird for a little bit. 
Um, but it's, okay. it's all it's all going to be better. As long when, as it doesn't when it's look done. like the spaceship from after the Bears renovation. Yeah. When the Bears played, I was I was living in mm-hmm. Illinois, and I had to cover the Bears in Champaign. No. And came back, and I'm like, well, this is the renovation. No. It's a spaceship it, on top of like <laughs> an artifact, and it's not going to be. I mean, personally, if they're gonna if they got to renovate the stadium, then I, I think they just really renovate in the sense of okay you're using the same space but you got to build build it from the ground up still you know don't it, like just that's a problem with what the bears did is they kind of they kept parts and bits and pieces of what that old stadium was and they just tried to build on top of it and it just didn't work out um whereas in miami they rebuilt like everything so uh, i think that's what they would want like would like to do with this but we'll see we'll see yeah all right That's a look at what happened at the owners' meetings. A little more from free agency. Up next, we have a little fun. Fact or fiction talking a little NFL free agent wide receiver class. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Bet on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Welcome back in to Cleveland Browns Daily, presented by BallyBet, coming soon to Ohio. I'm Jason Gibbs, alongside Anthony Poizel and Nick Paulus, who's back at the studio running things for us. Coming up uh, in about 20 minutes from now, Juan Thornhill's exclusive CBD interview with Nathan Zagura, Charles Davis in Hour 2 from CBS and NFL Network. Uh, a little fun, too, as well. It's Kyle Brandt's uh, description of the coach's picture uh, that was taken at the owners' meetings <laughs> and his breakdown of that. It's a tradition that we play here on CBD, I, and I feel like we play it every year on, on opening day. So – uh, right place and right time for that, as Bo likes to say, Poizel. Uh, it's a f- on a first Friday, you should act accordingly. Right. Have a cocktail. The problem was I had about ten last night, and that would explain a lot about the voice and how everything's feeling today in my body, which currently hates me. But that's all that's right. Tough. We had family in town and hadn't seen the family in a while, and made the most of it. Yeah, I would be remiss if I said I also did not celebrate a first Friday. Uh, went out with. Uh, my pickup hockey team, Brea Bombers. I, I know oh, some of them. Oh, a little shout out. Some of them might be listening right now. Um, shout out to the Bombers, and uh, you know, capped off a, a great, a great and fun season last night, and uh, went to uh, McGinty's Pub, had a couple of drinks there. So my good friend Pat McGinty who owns McGinty's. Yeah, it was great. Uh, so, so we great had a little pub. bit of a first Friday celebration as well. Very nice. How is the hockey team? Are we good? Are we not good? We 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 are better than last year. That That's is all the best. We are better than last year. I'm, I'm not sure what our record is, uh, but. We, we were in every single game this year, and that uh, alone is, is, is a huge jump in the right direction. On a and power ranking, where would you rank yourself on this team? No other names well, needed, uh, but where would you put yourself on, your, on the power rankings? You are just opening it up for me to get absolutely roasted by teammates, no matter what I, I say here, which – that's what I'm trying. I to know. Do. I understand. Uh, I, I'm gonna say I'm just I'm middle of the pack. Uh, I think we've got like 16, 17 people on the team. I'll say I'm um, seven, eight. It's number seven and eight. I'll say right, right around right around that number. Range. That's so a, that's an above average. Yeah, I mean, well, I played for uh, what, 12, 13, 14 years, and everybody on the team has has played for a long time too. So. I'll just say I'm I'm right in the middle of the pack. All right. I played wing, uh, played a little bit of center. All right. You you sit on that fence. You're fine. Yeah, I'm really curious to all see good. I'm what happens on my phone now. But <laughs> well, I, I think they're all busy. We, we've got lots of things going on internally today. So I'm sure. Yeah. All right. With that, let's play a little fact or fiction. Paul has hit the music and let's get going. Uh, right now. It is predicting the 2023 performances of wide receivers that change teams. NFL.com. First things first. DJ Moore traded by the Carolina Panthers to the Chicago Bears. Well, uh, according to NFL.com, they say his 2023 numbers will be better. Poizel, is that fact or fiction? Yeah, no, this is a fact. Uh, if DJ Moore is not better with Justin Fields and the Bears next year, then, then something terribly wrong is going on in Chicago. Uh, he's a talented guy who never really had a, a true talented quarterback uh, for Carolina. Now he's got – he's in really good hands with a, an up-and-coming QB who showed some really, really good moments last year. Yeah, they finally got him a weapon. Exactly. Novel concept. Exactly. And I, I just think th- this is the a perfect situation for DJ Moore. Um Things are always a little shaky with with the Bears. You never really know for sure. Boy, that's an understatement. Yeah, but I really like his fit with Justin Fields, and I think this is what Justin Fields needs. I think this is what DJ Moore needs. DJ Moore absolutely should be and needs to be better than what he has been last, or what he was last year with the Panthers, uh, with the Bears this year. For for them to really find the offense that they've been looking to find now in year three with Justin Fields. All right, next. Oh, no, the Factor Fiction button's not working. Oh, Paulus. <laughs> oh, no. That's all right. It, it's got to be out of date. I'll, uh, we'll, I'll see if we'll, I can try and get we'll it up blame to date it. We'll blame it on Fontana and Cunningham because that's usually Absolutely. the case yeah, we can definitely both do of that. them. Uh, all right, Paulus, I'll lead off with you here. Factor Fiction, Brandon Cooks will be better in 2023 with the Dallas Cowboys because that's what NFL.com says he will be. Brandon Cooks. Now, Brandon Cooks, I'm just looking up his stats Wide receiver last year. last year, 13 games, 57 catches, 700 receiving yards, and three touchdowns. Yeah, that is – he is definitely going to be uh, way, way, way better than that, especially with Dak Prescott 
able to throw him the ball. Now, Dak Prescott, as we all know, is an overrated quarterback. That's just a straight-up fact. It's a history of Dallas Cowboy quarterbacks, if you go as, back. As a lot of them are, yes. Look no at Tony doubt Romo. That. Overrated. Uh, you can look at Troy Aikman as well. Yes, <laughs> I agree. As well. Uh, the only reason why he's in is because of those Super Bowl rings, and he can thank Emmett Smith and that offensive line for that, as well as the playmaker. The playmaker. playmaker made a lot of plays for him as well. But Dak Prescott is – if we know one thing about Dak, Dak's going to get his yards. He's going to get his touchdowns. It's all about the choking aspect for Dak. And I think that he's going to – he Brandon Cooks is going to put up yards as the number two wide receiver there to CeeDee Lamb. But I, outside of that, I mean, if we're look, if we're talking about success, they're, they're not going to make it out of the first round like they typically don't. Boys out, fact or fiction? Yeah, definitely a fact. I mean, just looking at what Cooks did last year, and it even felt toward the end of the year – he just didn't, wasn't really doing anything. and uh, He didn't want to play. He wanted to be traded. Exactly. And the Cowboys, they wanted him. I think he's still got talent. He's 29. He's definitely getting a little older, uh, but not over 30 yet. And I really like what he, what he might be able to do now that he's on a roster that's got guys that are also going to draw a lot of attention from the defense, right? I mean, C.D. Lamb, Michael Gallup, all two, two talented players. And so I think, again, if Brandon Cooks isn't topping those numbers, I think something, something could be going wrong with the Cowboys offense. All right. Next. Fact or fiction? Alan Lazard, year six, age 27, ends up signing with the New York football Jets. With the Packers last year, 15 games, 60 catches, 788 receiving yards, six touchdowns. They say he will be worse. Poisal, fact or fiction? I'm going with fact again because even if – this Aaron Rodgers deal to the Jets does go through, which, again, we talked about it last week. It's nothing. all about the compensation, it yeah. appears, right now. That's the coming out of the yeah. owner's meeting. But nothing is official in this league until it's official. Now, even if Aaron Rodgers does go to New York, right, he's still going to have competition. Still, uh, uh, Lazard is still going to have competition with Garrett Wilson. Uh, I, I agree. I, th- I, I Fact, I think his numbers will be worse, but I don't think it'll be much worse, though. I mean, if, if Aaron is still in New York and – He's going to find a way to get the ball to his guy. Poizal. I'm sorry, po- Paulus. Paulus and Poizal. I've got two. Yeah. Uh, a little different right there, but yeah, it, Paulus. similar. Yeah. Fact or fiction? Uh, I believe they say he's going to have worse numbers. I think he's going to actually have better numbers, personally. So I think that is actually, what would that be? Fiction then, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, so 60 uh, receptions, 788 yards, and six touchdowns last year for Lazard. I'm looking at it from the standpoint of Aaron's going to need to throw to someone that he's comfortable with because he is going to be in New York. Whether that's now or three months from now, it's absolutely going to happen here. So what we're going to do is, yeah, I will say Alan Lazard is going to have more yards, more touchdowns, and a better overall year. Up next, Jacoby Myers to the Los Angeles, now the Las Vegas Raiders with the Patriots in 2022, 14 games, 67 catches, 804 yards, six receiving touchdowns. NFL.com says his numbers will be better in 2023 as he gets the ball from one Jimmy Garoppolo. Paulus, fact or fiction? I think it's actually going to be fact. I think that he is going to have some better numbers because Jimmy G is going to be going back to an offense that he's comfortable with and I mean, you got to hope for the injury history not to, you know, bite him, you know, bite him in the butt again. But as we all know, Jimmy G is probably going to get injured somewhere along the way. Jared Stidham actually didn't look bad, uh, too terrible in that offense with, uh, uh, God, what, what's, why can't I remember his name? Who's the, uh, oh my God. For, for which team? We're talking to the Raiders, right? uh, Yeah, for the Raiders. Uh, Josh McDaniels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no, I I believe he's actually going to have a better year. No matter who's throwing in the ball, I think he's going to have a better year. It it can't be any worse than what Mac Jones was. Boys Al? Uh, I'm going to go with fiction. And I I just – I don't see things working out the way that people think it will with Josh McDaniels in in Las Vegas. No. Um, I'm looking at what – I mean, Jacoby Myers did not have a bad year last year. He – 804 total receiving yards, six total touchdowns, right? Not – not numbers that are going to blow anything out of the water, but still not a bad year. And I just don't – I don't think that he like, – I don't know if Jimmy G is an upgrade over Derek Carr. Um, it's certainly possible that he can be, but I don't I don't know for sure. And that's because I just don't have a whole lot of uh, 
I don't have a whole lot of trust in that in, in what Josh McDaniels is, has done so far, and is not just with the Raiders, but his whole history as in a head general, coach. In general, yeah, yes, he doesn't give you any. Yeah, so agree. So I'm going to go fiction on Jacoby having a better season in 2023. I I I don't think it's any kind of slam dunk that he's going to that he is going to perform any better with the Raiders than he did last year with the Pats. All right, we've got about a minute left. So real quick, anybody think Juju Smith Schuster is going to have a better year this year playing with the New England Patriots? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> what about Adam Thielen with the Carolina Panthers? Uh, probably not. I'm not going to say absolutely not, but probably not. He's 70 just, catches last year, 716 yards, six receiving touchdowns. Like, He's 33 years old. To me, that no. – yeah. I was going to say no, – what? Go ahead, Paulus. Again, you start spending big money on free agents. This is what I, happens. I was just going to say, like, I understand he's going to be, you know, in a new situation. He's probably the number one down in Carolina now, but you're going to have a rookie throwing you the ball. And I believe C.J. Stroud is going to go number one. And I love C.J., but he's a rookie. And good luck with that. So I don't think he's going to come anywhere near those numbers. Yeah, I mean, Thielen's a 33-year-old receiver, and if he's the number one, that means he's going to be going against some very, very talented cornerbacks every week, whereas in Minnesota, he, th- th- those guys were lining up against Justin Jefferson. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see how Thielen's going to be able to have a better year. I, or I think that to me this signing screams something that's like it's just not going to pan out for, for, for next year. I don't think so. Anthony Poizel. It's been a pleasure, my friend. You've held your own quite nicely. Well done. Look forward to having you back soon, my friend. Um, look forward to having you back on CBD next week for a little higher or lower with the boys when they return. Always looking forward to it and thankful for the opportunity to, to jump on here for a full hour, Gibbs. This was a fun time. Perfect. Good. We appreciate it. Nick Paulus, appreciate your help. Nick and I stick around for hour two coming up next. Nathan Zagura's exclusive one-on-one with safety, Juan Thornhill. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by BallyBet, coming soon to Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Hour two of Cleveland Browns Daily brought to you by BallyBet. I'm Jason Gibbs on this football Thursday. Glad you're with us. Now to hear from some of the luminaries that we've been talking to over the last few weeks and over the last month that maybe we just we haven't had a chance to present to you yet. And this is as good a time as any. New Brown safety Juan Thornhill. He's played in three Super Bowls. Well, he's played in two Super Bowls. 1-1. One, one. He's been to three. He was hurt the first time when the Chiefs won their first one. Got the chance to get back two more times, including – Oh, this, this January's win over the Philadelphia Eagles. He is now a Cleveland Brown. And before he met with the media, he sat down with our own Nathan Zagura for this exclusive Cleveland Browns Daily one-on-one interview. Juan, first of all, well, you're down 11 minutes. Browns, how's it kind of been just from the moment that you signed, going through everything, coming through the facility today? You know, what's it been like for you? I mean, it's been amazing. Just like uh, signing here, like, Free agency, I didn't know where I was going to be, first of all. But then signing here, I was excited. Like, just looking at the players and my teammates, they're going to be, hey, they're going to be really great teammates. These guys are really good players. But um, I arrived at Cleveland last night, and I came here with, like, not knowing what to expect. I mean, because that's how I try to walk into everything. Um, getting downtown, just starting there. Yeah. I mean, the city's beautiful. Like, I mean, I love it already. Like, I've been trying to just see everything around here, walking around the facilities. The facility is amazing as well, so I'm really loving it. Well, we're certainly happy to have you here. You mentioned the start of free agency. You didn't know what was going to happen for the mm-hmm. first time in your career, right? You get drafted in the second round by the Chiefs, play your whole career there, and we'll get into that that storied career that you had yeah. there in a second. But what was it like when you got the call? What was kind of the – walk us through the negotiation when it became real that you could become a Cleveland Brown and then your decision to say, yeah, I, I want to be a Cleveland Brown. Um, I was out in – uh, Miami, Florida with my fiance, just, um, congratulations. Just, yeah. Thank you. Uh, just walking around. Then all of a sudden I was in the car and I got a phone call from my agent. He was like, Juan, well, we got some, something that we need to take care of. And I'm in a hotel lobby. My heart's pounding. Cause I'm like, all right, where am I going? I'm just, I don't know where I'm about to go. And I'm just excited. And they told me that uh, I was coming to Cleveland. I felt like I was going to cry. Honestly, just like, felt like drive day all over again. Yeah. I was just super excited and finally knew where I was going to go. And Cleveland is a great city. I've heard a lot of great things about being here in this organization. So I'm excited to be here. Passionate fans, which you're going to hear about. Mm-hmm. You've heard about the dog pound. You brought your own dog pound here today. Yep. What's the story with the, with the dogs making the trip? Because you're coming to the dog pound. You yeah. said they got to come. I brought my dogs to the dog pound. <laughs> so I'm the biggest dog in the dog pound, baby. The, Let's the, go. I love that. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about Kansas City. You, you go there. You play in three Super Bowls, right? You win two of those Super Bowls. The first one, obviously, you were injured. You weren't able to play. So to get back into that game, to be able to play in it, and to win it this year, what did that mean to you? I mean, it was – I mean, I had a lot going on. Like you said, um, I tore my ACL in 2019. Not being able to, to play in that Super Bowl, just like sitting in the stands, watching your teammate, your teammates and your team run out the locker room, playing in the biggest game, the biggest stage – and you know you growing up wanting to play in that game your whole sure. life. And it was my rookie season. Um, but it, it was sickening, just like sitting there and just watching them play, knowing that I'm supposed to be a part of it. Um, but we won. So I had mixed emotions. Like, I'm sad. And at the same time, I'm happy. But uh, it just made me more hungry to work harder to get back into that game so I can possibly play in it and to win a Super Bowl. And I got there again, but we lost that one, so I don't even want to talk about that one. Sure, sure, sure. Um, But then I had the opportunity to make it back this year, and I was able to play in this one and actually win it. Um, It was truly amazing just being able to get that feeling. is is an experience that is hard to explain, that you just have to be there and just seeing, like, the confetti fall and knowing that all the work that you put in throughout the season is, is finally paid off, and you're the best in the NFL, and it's the best feeling ever. How hungry were you when you suffered that injury to get back on the field, to get back to a Super Bowl, to win it? It took three years to win the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And some people never go to a Super Bowl in their whole career. Mm -hmm. But what kind of did you learn about yourself in that period where something that you took for granted, you were going to be playing, right, Mm -hmm. was taken away from you? I mean, I learned so much. Like you said, like um, not knowing that an ACL can slow you down as much as it did. I thought I was going to, I mean, yeah, I tore it. I was like, oh, I'll be fine. Like in a couple months and get out there. And I struggled mentally. For mentally and physically sure. for two years and I mean my knee bothered me for a while and I would say this year was my my first year being like a hundred percent and it showed like I performed well this year and I was just hungry all season to make plays and to get back to that game and I wanted to go out on a on a high note 
Well, he certainly did Super Bowl champion. He had three picks this year, career high in tackles as well. And now you come to the Cleveland Browns. When you go and you sign a contract like that, is that something even as a young man that you, you thought was, was possible to sign, you know, for 20 plus million dollars? And, and what does that kind of mean to you thinking, you know, your upbringing to where you are here today? See, with me, I, I always bet on myself. Like yeah. that is something that I've always been knowing that I could do. Like uh -huh. I, growing up, I used to tell people that I was going to play in the, eight, in the NFL in the eighth grade. And people would laugh at me. I remember, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm going to show well, you. Well, you're laughing now. Yeah, I'm laughing now. <laughs> but then once you get into the NFL, they say that it's hard to make it to that second contract. Only a select few guys make it to that second contract. And with me, even, even after I told my ACL, I knew that I was going to get here because I feel like I work harder than most of my opponents and the guys that's next to me as well. And when you got a guy in your room that works hard, you're going to push each and everyone to, to work even harder. It's because you're a competitor. Absolutely. I read you said something, you know, I don't care if I'm playing cornhole, whatever it is, you want to win. Mm -hmm. I love that. I feel like that's a mentality you have to have because you must hate losing, right? Losing I must hate, make you sick. I hate losing. Like, I've been born a winner. Like, a lot of people don't know, I got five state championships coming out of high school. So, like, I'm just used to winning. That's something that I do, and I, I don't plan on stopping now. Well, look, we'd love to bring that here to the Cleveland Browns. What does it take? You've been around it, right? What does it take? from an individual standpoint, the commitment you must make, and then also from a team standpoint, what does it actually take? And Patrick Mahomes probably helps a little bit too, oh, yeah. but what does it take to win a Super Bowl and to be elite year after year after year in this very competitive league? I mean, it takes more than what you you think, like small things. Like a lot of guys think that football, you just come to practice and you just practice that together and you just go your separate ways. No, it takes more than that. You have to be able to build those relationships with your teammates like things like that will make you so much better like and that's one thing that i'm looking at bringing here is just uh bringing the defense together the office together bringing everybody together because if you build those relationships with one another it makes you dominant believe it or not you can instead of just communicating calls on the field you can look at each other and know what you're thinking because you've been around each other so much and i just think that things like that make you more dominant what was it like for you this year working with so many rookies, right? You guys mm -hmm. had the, basically the entire back end other than yourself and Legereus rookies, and you were able mm -hmm. to get them to play at a high level and mold them, and you're going to come here now. you got some younger guys. Greg's in his third year. MJ's going to be in his second year. Grant's in his fourth year, and then you got Denzel. But they're guys who at least have played. What was that like working with so many rookies and then now coming to a place where you've got some more established guys? Um, it, was, it wasn't as bad as people would think. Like I, was, I thought it was going to be like hard having a bunch of guys that like just now got into the NFL, but those guys made it so much easier on me, honestly. like I tell this story all the time. Like I remember me coming in as a rookie. I was trying to study the playbook by myself each and every night, frustrated, like wanting to cry sometimes because yeah. it's hard to pick up on the playbook and not really having anybody to talk to about it. But these rookies, they, they stepped in and they went about doing it themselves. They had like groups together and they would study the playbook together. So if one person didn't know it, the other guys did. So like I said, they made it easy on me and I was just the older guy, like the vet, that if they didn't understand something, they can come and ask me. And I'll be that guy to let them know, like, what's right and what's wrong. Who was the one that taught you how to be a pro? Because that's, I think, one of the big keys in this league, right, is um, learning how to be a pro. Yeah, uh, I would say Tyron Matthew. Like, the guy, manager. yeah, the guy, he's, I mean, he's a competitor. You can see that. And I think that's what helped me out as well. Like, I mean, just watching him practice each and every day, like, he's not trying to lose a rep on the field. Um, he's just a great leader. So when you're in Kansas City, I got up in the front, Chris Jones, pretty good mm -hmm. game record, can yep. get after the quarterback. Come here now, you're going to have a guy named Miles Garrett. Pretty darn good game record, can get after the quarterback. When you're on the back end and you know that the quarterback knows, there's a finite amount of time that I can hold this football mm -hmm. before I'm going to get hit. How does that affect how you're able to play and maybe some of the chances you're able to take to go be around the ball? That makes my job so much easier. When you got a guy like Chris Jones and Miles Garrett up front, you know that you're only covering for maybe two seconds because the, uh, that third second, out. They, they, the ball's got to come out. And if they get back there and hit that quarterback, that's when the quarterback starts to throw balls up, and that's when they make it fun for me because I'm just covering 53 yards, sideline to sideline, picking everything off. So you, you're versatile as a safety, and I know you talk with Jim Schwartz, and he, he kind of likes that versatility, but do you like playing that center field role? And I know we'll play a lot of single high here and something that, that you like to do. It's fun. I mean, it's fun. When you really don't have any responsibility but play the quarterback and play the ball, like it doesn't get any better than that. Like it's, it's like a one-on-one -on -one matchup. Who's smarter and who can make who make a mistake? That's all it is, and I really enjoy being back there in that, in that deep third. Who are some of the quarterbacks that you like kind of having that battle with? 
Uh, a guy that I feel like I might have is uh, Derek Carr. Like, I like him. Well, he I went like, to the NFC. He's yeah, like, all right, Juan's yeah, going Derek over to the Browns Carr, and going to the and NFC. A, a guy that I feel like I was actually, like, I definitely lost that battle was Aaron Rodgers. Like, that's one guy I could not just, I couldn't figure out when I played him. I was a rookie back then, the deep third, and he was kind of, like, picking me apart. I couldn't figure out where he was going to go, and I felt like I struggled that game. But everyone else, I feel like I can get a good read on. Even Tom Brady, the GOAT, I feel like I had a good read on as well. Well, you're going to get another shot at Aaron Rodgers. Mm -hmm. If he does, in fact, make his way to the Jets, as it looks like he will, they will be playing the Browns this year, so he'll mm -hmm. get another shot at it there. Oh, yeah. What do you love about this game? I mean, it's a, it's a man's game. That's what makes me the most excited about it. Like, a lot of people... Like when you get frustrated or you, you have anger built up, what do you have to do? You have to keep it in. You have to go into your room and, and not really let it out. Sure. But um, when you come to this game right here, you can let out any frustration you want. You get paid to, to hit someone as hard as you can. So that's what I love most about this game. Well, we're certainly going to like that. And Browns fans, as you probably have already seen, are intense. They are passionate. And you come from a very passionate fan base in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Arrowhead gets rocking. First Energy is going to be rocking for you as mm -hmm. well. But two things real quick. One. Your teammates, I know that Deshaun reached out to you. I know Miles Garrett reached out to you. What was it like to kind of have the, the stars of this football team welcome you in with open arms? I mean, it was amazing. When your leaders of your team reach out to the guys that's coming in, it shows that they're great leaders. I mean, they're willing to uh, welcome anyone that comes into this locker room. And I just feel like guys like that, when you have those guys in your locker room, just makes things so much better. And I love to be around guys like that. 30. already talked about how you've liked Cleveland. I don't know if Travis Kelsey told you anything since you've come here. He's a Cleveland guy, yeah. and you may get a chance to see him. But what's something you want the fans of the Cleveland Browns to know about you? When they look out there and they see Thornhill, when they see that on the back of your jersey, what do you want them to be thinking about you as a player, as a man, or, or anything at all that you want them to know? I was brought here for a reason, and the reason that I'm here is to get us to the Super Bowl. is that simple. The ball in the air, Thornhill's going to get it. Just believe in Thornhill. I love it. Juan, pleasure to meet you. Congratulations, Thanks, and welcome sir. to the Cleveland Browns. Thank you. You're up. Welcome to the Cleveland Browns. Safety Juan Thornhill. Looking forward to seeing him uh, lace him up this fall and looking forward to talking with him more uh, as the offseason moves forward and we get into the workout phases and then OTAs and then mini camp in early June and then back for real in mid-July. We'll take a timeout when we come back. More of our exclusive interviews. Nathan Zagura goes one-on-one -on -one with the great Charles Davis from NFL Network and CBS Sports. That's when Cleveland Browns Daily, presented by Bally Bet, continues on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
All right, welcome back to Cleveland Browns Daily. Jason Gibbs here. We're playing some of the some of the interviews that haven't made the show over the last month because, frankly, we've had a, a lot of content and a lot coming from the NFL Combine that was already a month ago. Hard to believe. But one of our favorite interviews and favorite moments and, and a day that's worthy of this, especially if you're looking to get into the broadcast industry, here's some advice from the great Charles Davis, CBS Sports and NFL Network with our own Nathan Zagura from just a month ago at the NFL Combine. This is a real treat for me. You're down. Somebody that I look up to certainly as a mentor and an idol in the commentary business. Yeah. But the great Charles Davis joins us now. How are you, CD? It's great I, to see you. I'm doing well. Thank you very much. It's always great to sit with you. And congratulations on finishing your first year in the booth. And Thank you. Having a good time. And, and, you know, I appreciate your very, very kind words. But we're going to have to set your sights a little bit higher. We got <laughs> we got to jump you up, get you to somebody really, really good. We'll do that from now on. That is you. And oh, I appreciate your kind. I appreciate your humility. But you listen, you helped me so much when just kind of talking about the process, the preparation, and you hooked me up with a guy to get my boards done right and, and all of that. And it was it was fun and, and getting to our relationship over the last few years, you know, getting yeah. to help you out with some Browns yeah. games. You helped me you helped me in a big way. You know that because being able to go and get ready for a game, no one knows a team better than the people who are around the team, right? Who who are embedded in a yeah. sense. And I hope I've been doing it the right way. My goal is always when I talk with you or anyone else who's around team as I'm preparing for a game, I'm not asking for the secrets. I'm not asking right. for you to violate any confidences because you are with that team. All I want to know is who do we think is going to play on That's Sunday? That's right. Yeah. Who do you need so, on so the board? Who right. will be on the board on Sunday so I can be prepared for that? Because it's just the way things have changed since COVID for all of us, right? And I like it, the way the league has changed how a team is, you know, it used to be so restrictive, didn't it, sure. about how many guys. Could, I just love the fact that we have more people available. I'd love to see the rosters expanded, but I know the owners are like, Same. Yeah. Yeah. the owners are like, um, yeah, it's not that, your money, right, dude. Ours. Exactly. No one asked you. <laughs> exactly. All I'm saying is who do I think will be on the field on Sunday so I pre can prepare and do the best job I can for that team, for that person, our, our team been doing coverage, and I appreciate your help. Well, listen, we didn't get to cross paths this year, but one of the best tips that Jim strange, Donovan. Strange, right? I know, very strange, that our play-by-play -play guy gave me was watch the TV copy of the opponent from the week before or even the prior two weeks so you get to hear what they had told those commentators and you can mm -hmm. pick up some nuggets pick along the way. Nuggets. So I got to listen to you a lot because <laughs> you called our opponents the week before many, many times how, this year. How wild is that? Yeah, but I, did get to, I didn't get to see it. But maybe this year we'll, we will get to see each other. Yeah, I certainly hope so. I look forward to it. And the other part is what we gain from local knowledge national does doesn't you know if we gain it there when we're saying it it's fresh for another set of another another audience because if you're not locked in on being a browns fan or if we're doing any you know whoever your team is you're gonna hear what you hear you're like god and of course we all know that but everyone else listening may not know that sure. information so we try and we try and glean as much as we can too so in my, with me, I'm with the Browns. Every game's a Browns game. My audience are Browns fans, period. Yeah. And you kind of brought that up there. But what I appreciate about what you're able to do when you listen to a game is that there are a lot of times when national guys will do games, and they just it's clear they don't know how to pronounce anybody's name. They, they don't know. It would be as if they dropped somebody in <laughs> to call the game. But you make it feel like almost that you've worked with the Browns. Or I listened to – you had a few Steelers and – you had Steelers-Patriots, think, earlier this yeah, year. we did. But you made it sound like you worked for the Steelers and the <laughs> Patriots, which I think – that eliminates the one big gripe about the way that the system is set up right yeah. now, right? Yeah. And so that, that, I think, is one that, of the, the, the that, traits. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and it's something I work at. I'm not, I know I'm not 100%, but we try our best to get it right. And I think that all of us who are in the business, if you've ever encountered a family member when you've been mispronounced oh, yeah. their, their loved one's name, Ooh, you don't want <laughs> you it, don't you, want that you don't right. want that anymore plus it's just a straight respect yeah, for right. that person you're trying your best and when i do get it wrong i feel horrible and i want to get it right the next time and i think if you do it with effort if you try your best and they know you're trying your best like alberto the tight end in endeavor just, just look with, stick with, with that I've I'll heard pronounce. his name pronounced I don't know how many different ways. And we every time we're asking. So last I've gotten was Okwe Boonam. And then the next is someone, no, 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 it's okay, Boonam. Okay, Boonam. And so so you're trying to you're trying your best to get it and hopefully I can get to him and say, Okay, can I can, can you give it to me? And hopefully I have it. But for Indianapolis, 
Bobby Okereke uh-huh. this year. Right. It wasn't Okereke That's his third. Before. Yep. That's his third. And I, when I see Bobby, I'm going to say, dude, that's the third pronunciation we've had on you. Because it was Okarike. Right, it was Okarike, right. And then before that, it was, I, mean, I remember. But I remember saying to Ian Eagle, my partner, I said, isn't this like the third? He goes, I believe this is the third. But whatever you want to be called, we want to just try and do it the right way. We've had guys who have changed, and I do our pronunciation guide. Yeah. I'm the audio of our own pronunciation guide. And we've had guys who have changed it. In the middle of the season? Yeah. Tyrod, Torod, Njoku, Najoku. I just want to know, yeah. and I want to try and do it the way that you yeah, want. Sometimes I just stick with the chief. And let me tell you, this is how old I am. Tony Dorsett, the great running back, Yeah. prior to his senior year at Pittsburgh, it was Tony Dorsett. Dorsett does have a little more panache. And then Dorsett with the punching the, yeah. the, the Dorsett. And I played for his college coach, Johnny Majors. He coached co- Tony, and, you know, Tony, that was his baby now, okay? Yeah. That was his all-time baby. Sure. To the day Coach Majors died, he called him Dorset because he never had that door set. Yeah. If you go back to New Jersey, where Joe Theismann's family is from, and you ask for the Theismann family, someone will say, you mean the Theismans? Because it was Theismann. And then his SID at Notre Dame, Roger Valdeseri, the great sports information director, said, we're going to change it to Theisman because it rhymes with Heisman. Heisman. And they were trying sure. to give him the Heisman trophy. And he became Joe Theisman and never looked back. That's unbelievable. That great? See, this but is you, a great yeah. – You go back to that home area, they're going, can I see the Theismans? You mean the Theismans? Because <laughs> that's the proper pronunciation. So we try. And as I said, Ian is a master. I mean, he nails it. Evan Washburn, my, my, my partner on the team, he nails it. I'm trying my best to get into their category. You're doing just fine. Just one thing for all the people listening, what would be the number one piece of advice you'd give somebody who wanted to get into the booth and and call games? I can only do it from my perspective because I was fortunate enough to have played college football. I didn't make it in the NFL, so I was one of those, like, this is like me doing NFL games is like an alien dropped out of the sky. This isn't supposed to happen. And prior to Kirk Herbstreit doing Amazon this year, if you take away what I call the super specials, Dennis Miller, right? Um, you know, it, when Rush Limbaugh did, but he, sure. didn't do it, but he didn't do it in the booth. It was Dennis Miller, and who else came in? Tony Kornheiser, uh-huh. guys like that. I call them the super specials because they are true outliers. I was the only one doing NFL games. I hadn't played in the NFL, hadn't been an executive, hadn't been a coach. Then Kirk came along this year and joined me in that. And I remember going to my first game. I was nervous as heck. It was Carolina, Philadelphia. And I kind of mentioned to Coach Andy Reid as I coach, you know, I ain't playing the league. I ain't coaching the league. How, what's, how am I going to be received? And he looked me dead in the eye, and he goes, if you know what you're talking about, you'll be fine. If you don't know what you're talking about, you'll hear about it. And that was it. That was it. And so hopefully people think that I am. So you ask my question, know what you're talking about. And yeah. what I mean by that is know the history of your sport, know how what you're doing fits into that history of the sport, recent history, long history, all those things. Know the rule book as much as possible because most games that we do, you're not going to have a a a gene steratore that you can rely on. And fans, as I've discovered, if they don't think you know the rule book, they come for you because you're supposed to know that. So my goal is, and Gene knows this, and when I was at the place out west before that, I would tell Mike Prayer and Dean Blandino, my goal is for you to confirm what I say. That's my goal. Right. I'm not going to always get it, but I don't want to be, hey, uh, we're going to find out what the rule is. Why am I here? Sure. Okay? So know the rules on all that. Know the players, just what you talked about before, players' names. Know the backgrounds. Know sure. all of that. And I will leave them with this. Have the passion that you're not going to be stopped. Because if you have that, you have a chance. If you don't have the passion about that, then you're not. You have no chance. Because there's a lot of us diving in all the time. Who wants it? Who will work hard enough at their craft? Who will hone their craft? Who will think about it morning, noon, and night? Who will do the research? Who will do the path? All of those things have to go into it. But you gotta want it, want it, want it, want it, want it. Period. Period. Right? No doubt. And, and, and Especially and, when you're an outlier. When you're, you an, outlier, you're an outlier. And I'm I a bigger. Outlier. No, I'm a bigger But outlier. that's what we want yeah, out of the absolutely. whole thing. And, and the last thing I would say is, you know, when you're going through all that process and you're doing all those things, what are your relationships with people? That's what it's all about. That's what it all comes down to. Because 
the people who are doing all this for us now, who set up all this, who are filming us right now, who are doing all those things, those are our teammates. They are not anything else. They are your colleagues. Oh, yeah. And when I, I'm always flabbergasted when I see people that don't do that. You got to love the people you're with, right? Because relationships in every aspect of it, in terms of you want to never stop learning, right? About the never game. stop you need learning with coaches, players, all that. Everyone it takes, as you it's mentioned, a it big, takes a lot it's of big relationship. I could business. never be on the air without Gibbe. See, but you know that, and that is wonderful, and it probably blows you away when you run into people in our business, and you're like, they're doing what with the people that they work it with? It requires no effort to be nice. No effort, and and we try our best. That's all we can do. Well, that's right. Hopefully well, you won't good. catch me on that bad day when you go, he's such a jerk, that Davis. That day has not come. You know? You always have a smile in your on your face and in your voice, and that's why it's yeah. always it's a pleasure. Let's hey. talk about something really important now. You got though. it. Yellowstone series. Yellowstone, <laughs> 1923. 18, 1883. What, what's your ranking of the three shows? Well, Yellowstone's the heart because that's, that's where it all began for me, but I really enjoyed 1883 because uh-huh. Of the different perspective, the 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 the, view, the beauty and the grandeur of what we were shown. Because remember, that was America Stunning. somewhat unspoiled at that time, That's right. right? So we didn't we didn't have urban sprawl at that time. Yeah. Uh, so so that was amazing. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, you know, they're still losing lives and the whole thing like the regular Yellowstone. And I thought, why wouldn't they? Eighteen eighty three is a lot more brutal it's time to live barbaric. than than, than, yeah. than now. And then the 1923 has started, and, and it's Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren. I mean, I'm loving it. I am just like, this is this is incre- incredible. And I did see where the um, the, the, the star, and I, I wish I knew her name. I hate it. The Native American woman who's She's in the school. And unbelievable. she was saying that there had been some criticism about how brutal the conditions and how the, and she's like, this is real. Real. And by the way, maybe people should be reminded of what my people went through. Yeah. And I thought that was one of the greatest answers. It's tough to watch, but it reminds me of us as people as we continue to evolve. Oh, yeah, we all count. Okay? Let's let's make sure we do it and treat each other the right way. But I just love the shows. Um, Taylor Sheridan, <laughs> he keeps getting people. And then all of his other offshoots. Tulsa King with Sly Stallone, right? Uh, I haven't watched Kingstown it, but I heard it's with, Jer- great. with Jeremy Renner. Wow. Yeah. And people are signing up wanting to be a part of these franchises. I mean, when you get Helen Mirren and Harrison Ford, when you get Tim McGraw and Faith Hill, Kevin Costner headlining, you're doing something right. I'm a big Spencer fan. And I I learned to never challenge a professional game hunter (laughs) to a duel on a boat. Right. Don't do it. Don't bad do idea. It. It's a really bad idea. Especially when you've been beaten three times and he's (laughs) like, look, I'm not going to kill you unless you force me to do it. But. If that's what it's going to be. Go take a flight. Take a little, it, take a, go that's soar. That's what it's going to be. Yeah. So there I am. I'm lucky enough to work with CBS. Paramount is our, yeah, is of our parent company. And please, someone, hear this. Hear this. I can see a role for you. I want to at least go out and see how it's done. That's all I'm asking. I'm a huge fan. Just just want to go see how it's done. I you a great cameo for and if, you. And if somehow I wander into a camera shot or yeah. two. Who am I to complain? Certainly. Although, although once I do it, they'll probably ban me from the I'm going to be keeping my eyes peeled for that now. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I wandered through that second time, <laughs> get him out of here. <laughs> He's done. He's done. All right. When, what do you like so much about the combine, and what are you focused on this week? I'm just uh, – what I like about it is it's a, it's a reunion for all of us. And when we had COVID and we couldn't see each other, couldn't be around each other, couldn't touch each other, it was hard. Yeah, because we talk about relationships. We all have relationships all around this league, and we're forming new relationships with these youngsters coming in because who knows who's going to come to the Browns, who knows who's going to go to the Eagles. All those things kick in, so we're starting that process one more time when we're doing it, plus we're greeting old friends again. That yeah. part is wonderful. The other part is I love seeing who emerges out of here that maybe we haven't talked about as much. And what was interesting is Isaiah Pacheco with Kansas City, the running back, had such a great year for them and was so pivotal in what they did and was wonderful in the Super Bowl. He blew away the combine, yet still went in the seventh round. So you just don't know. I'm not one of those that like, oh, God, I want every great story to be the the underdog rising. I like seeing the people who are at the top of the food chain confirm their greatness. Look like it. Right. I like seeing Aiden Hutchinson last year be the number two pick overall and be really good his rookie year. I like seeing Trayvon Walker be a good player at the top of the board. Wasn't as good as Hutchinson, was good as Sauce Gardner, but he was no bust. Right. So I don't mind that. I love seeing that. I don't like to see people fail. I mean, I, I want all you of them to be successful. You thrive on positivity. But, but we know that's not going to happen for everyone. Of course. We know that. Yeah. 
But at the same time, I just see no reason to be like, well, I hope this guy busts and this is terrible. No, I want them all to have their opportunity, and then the best are going to make it, whether they're seventh rounder, or undrafted free agent, or that first rounder confirming that he was great. Because Sauce Gardner was pretty good. But Tariq Woolen, the second best corner, is a rookie last year. He went in the fifth round at the University of Texas San Antonio. This story is everywhere. Very unique size speed combination. A former receiver, they flipped over to corner. Yeah, he was and pretty And I good. think you and I have talked about it. My thing right now is the receivers are getting taller again. They're longer, more angular. They can run. If you are the third receiver on your team catching 15 balls a year, get over on the other side of the field and learn how to backpedal because you might be the first corner. Right. You have a Changes. chance like that. Yeah, we got a big guy on our in our secondary last year, MJ Emerson, who had a very nice rookie season. We're I excited mean, about him. You flip him over and turn it. Woolen was Smart. a receiver, flipped at the end of his career at UTSA, and hasn't looked back. And the good news about it for them, the money's just as good. Money, the money's money's real good. <laughs> yeah, might because be just as good the name as a name of the game is throwing it and throwing it, it and catching it. Yeah. Right? You yeah. know what, what? What was the old uh, Bear Bryant? Protect Arn, rush there. <laughs> <laughs> Protect Arn, rush there. I love that. All right, leave you with this one. Just a couple Browns things. Number one, full off season with Deshaun Watson. Obviously, yeah. had those six games. What are you Huge. kind of expecting for the Browns? And then, is there anybody as you kind of look through this combine, maybe at receiver, maybe at the edge that, that you'd like to see wearing the brown and orange next year? Yeah, look, so many different opportunities, so many different options. I mean, if you know. Deshaun Watson, Clemson guy, doesn't have to match up that way. But these Ohio State receivers, they just keep pouring them out. And it'll be interesting to see how people look at Jackson Smith and Jigba because – He should go early, I think. You I think should think gonna... so. He's the best route runner, I think, probably out of yeah. the receivers in the draft. But that stopwatch is going to be interesting. And I'm wondering when he's going to run his 40 because he's coming off the hamstring. And the sure. last thing you want to do is pop another hammy. Is he going to run it? Is he not going to run it? Or are we just going to have to take it off of tape? I don't think he is a flyer taking it off the top, but I'd throw it to him every time I could. <laughs> because yeah, he's, he's going to be going to make some plays, yeah. right? A Jordan Addison is a slot guy from USC. I think he's a terrific player, not as super big and, and stout or anything like that. But, you know, we have them all through. And I think for anyone who thought last year Deshaun Watson would come back from everything he's come back from in terms of not playing, then, days. Then, then we have this, then we have that, that he's just going to be the Deshaun Watson that they signed. That was folly. Now he has a chance to do everything, plus the story has been told. We don't have to keep rehashing it. It's done. The the case, yeah, I assume the cases are over all that. Yes. He's got his offseason now. He's got his OTAs. He's got his mini camp. Chance to get with all of his people. He should look closer to the Deshaun. 30. Cleveland signed and wanted and expected. And, you know, however people want to look at it, view it, guess what? We're talking about football right now. We're talking about him coming back. This is his chance to get back to being a football player. And an elite one. Yeah, yeah. That's and that's would. why he was signed. Uh, yeah. And by the way, it wasn't just Cleveland who wanted to sign him. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. And listen, if we get back there, we're going to get a lot more games with you. So yeah, I'm we're looking for forward that. to that. We Charles, like coming to Cleveland. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you for always. the time. Right, great man. to see you as always. Great to see you. Really appreciate it. Take All right, care. the great Charles Davis will be back more. Cleveland Browns Daily brought to you by Ballybet here on 850 ESPN Cleveland. It's time to play your best game.
All right, back here on Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by BallyBet. Jason Gibbs with you. Uh, tomorrow we are off. Uh, Matt Fontana and Danny Cunningham and Nick Paulus will join you from 1 to 3. The crew uh, starts to get back together on Monday. Bo and I will be back. Zagura joins on Tuesday. One final segment here, and it's – it's an annual tradition. It's Kyle Brandt from NFL Network and Good Morning Football breaking down this year's coach's photo from the owners' meetings in Arizona. It's time, everybody. You're down. It was an era in, in this world when you didn't get photographs immediately. You couldn't just take a picture and then say, I like it, I don't like it. You had to take your film. You go to some place called the photo mm. mat, and you wait several days, and you get doubles, and you get mats, and they're better that way. And you come mm. up to, ooh, I like this one, I don't like this one. It's fun to wait for photographs, and we wait an entire year for the best photograph of the year. <laughs> and it is here, ladies and gentlemen, from that photo mat we call the annual league meeting. Bring it up. Bring up Woo! the gentlemen in all their glory. Oh, I love it. You love it. We love it. And I could go any number of directions. I could point out how Stefanski's dunking on everybody with the Jordans. Mm. Then McDermott's got on his Buster Browns going to piano recital. Or I could say that Matt Eberflus is sneaky hot in a tight sweater. And who knew? The fluce is loose. Well, let's hand out some awards. I like to hand out some hardware here. Let's start with the Don's Don't Wear Shorts Award. You remember Carmine Lupertazzi said it to Tony Soprano, Don's Don't Wear Shorts. They do here, baby. They wear shorts here. They wear whatever they want. Here we have 13 combined Super Bowls and zero pants. Imagine sitting next to somebody on a plane and both you guys have shorts on, just going leg to leg for the whole thing, and the leg hair is going. It's definitely sweating. And if I don't, it, it's almost like Belichick has his foot in a slight power move over this moccasin or whatever Andy Reid is wearing. I love it. And it's interesting because, Judon, your coach, He'll take a year off from the photo. He'll take a half decade off. Mm -hmm. Belichick showing up in the photo is like a comet. Like, you don't know when it's ever going to come back. And he's here. Andy is usually front and center. This is Jack Nicholson at the Oscars back in the day. It's Spike Lee at the Knicks game. Mm. But in years past, it hasn't always been that way. A little bit of an origin story. You always see the Tommy Bahama chic and all that. This is back in 2019 next to Flo and in front of Patricia. Times have changed. But he's said and said, he's like the lazy Susan in the middle of the table. Go back to the last one, though. He used to be kind of like over to the side. He wasn't always dead. 2018, standing in front of Pat Shermer and next to Bill O'Brien. He was way over here. I like it better here. I like him right in the middle where he belongs. Those guys get the Don's Don't Wear Shorts Award, but let's get in quickly to what I call the Honorary Annual Bruce Arians SPF Award for the least unprotected person. Dable, what are you doing? Are you kidding? This thing is crispy up top right here. I want to put this right now. Just, he needs like one of those parasols or something like that. The future is bright in New York, and so is the sun in Arizona, Dabes. You're a risk taker. You go for the two-point conversion. Not here. This son cooked you harder than Daniel Jones' agent, okay? You don't want to go like that. Expensive. Very expensive. He looks more toasted than Shanahan does over here. Shanny, I feel you, dude. Your quarterback gets hurt every single year. You're just cleaning out that mini bar. I would drink the mini Kahlua, too, if my quarterbacks kept getting hurt. Shanny, you've been a, an honorary member of these in the past. Somebody get him a hat. Somebody get him a cap. I know it's on no cap. Get him a cap. I like the shades. This is going to be third degree at some point. Moving on. The Boarding Group C Award. Mm. Let me show you these bros right here. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. These bros are on a flight to Vegas for a bachelor party. They're in row 37,000. Wait here. Lafleur, he's got his power shirt on. He's all stressed. Look at the stress in that face. Because he's got to figure out how to get 12 guys into a club that night. No women, just all 12 guys. Sean Payton's over here making sure everybody gets enough water. And Sean McVay's already blasted. Already. He's just, he gave up both armrests. He doesn't give a damn. He's got the shades on. Hey, man, when the drink girl comes by, ask for another vodka and vodka. Sean, there's no drink girl. We're still at the gate. She hasn't come by yet. What are you doing? He's leaning back with his watch and his shades and an entire half jar of pomade to make a perfect little wigwam on top of that head and just leaning back. I'm going to sleep for a little while. Tell me when we get there. This is a great trio. I want to hang with them. Next, the Kyle Brandt definitely owns this outfit award. Let's go to Brandon Staley. Oh, man. Guys, listen, he's going to try to do some damage in the AFC West. He already put a beat down on the Banana Republic. Staley, I got you. This is what you call the Luxury Touch Performance Polo. It's $70 right now on BananaRepublic.com. See how the jeans are distressed? Mm. They're distressed down there like the Chargers in the second half. It happens. And I understand, look, 
Coach, I love you. You want to add some new wrinkles to the offense, not the outfit. I would review the analytics of an ironing board, Coach. It's a big photograph. You're next to Mr. Crispy here and Mr. Piano Recital here. We can get a couple of these out. You get a steamer, you hang it in the shower, you run it really hot. There's lots of ways to do that. I love you. Stay. Look at how he's got that perfect two-inch zip down here. He doesn't go low plunging like Mr. Crispy, but he's got it just absolutely perfect. I respect the Banana Republic chic. We got to get those wrinkles chic. out, buddy. Staley, I love you. Now, I like this one, too. The Needs Their Own Netflix Show Award. Here we go. These two yeah. guys, yes. side by damn side. I'm just going to try this because it looks so cool. And I think if you just hang them like that. I mean, are you telling me that Tomlin and Bowles is not the coolest cop show on Netflix? <laughs> They're involved. They're unveiling a conspiracy that goes all the way to the top. Bowles, look at, look at Bowles. Well, he's seen. Talk about it. He's seen things, things, things you don't want to see, <laughs> things you can't unsee. I just, it's supposed to be good cop, bad cop, but I think they're both bad cop. <laughs> and if this is not worth 10 episodes on Netflix, I don't know what is. I love it. They're between Dan Campbell, who I can't believe just showed up kind of normal, and Arthur Smith, who appears he's never been in a photograph in his life. <laughs> and here we have Tomlin <laughs> and Bolt. It's coming to streaming soon. It's coming to Netflix. Next episode, binge that thing. Let us know. Um, this is a great one now. Let's move on to what I call Prom Night Dad Award. Here you go. Aww. You show up to Aww. pick up your date. Mm. Walk in. You got your little corsage. You got your tuxedo. McCarthy says, sit down, son. Looks oh. absolutely miserable. He's wearing 50 pounds of fabric, slacks, <laughs> shirt, blazer. Mike, we got a guy right here going bare sleeves. Dress it down a little bit. But I feel like the prom date comes in, and he's sitting there in his chair, and Mike McCarthy's got a pocket knife out, and he's peeling an apple and just eating slices right off the blade. And you know what's funny? You know what's funny is the prom night scenario? I feel like Gannon, he's the date right here next to me. <laughs> See that guy? That's the prom date. And he's, he knows what's up. And McCarthy's like, son, what are your intentions with my daughter? And Gannon's like, what aren't my intentions with your daughter, sir? Let me just get the hell out of here. Is that the date right there? Because if you're not careful, let's move on to the next award. The date might be this guy. We might just have to go, we might just have to go one over right here. I was waiting. Look out! I was waiting. Look up. I'm here to take out your daughter. I call this the $20,000 outfit award. Mike, what the hell is this? You have some sort of blazer over a sweater, over a zip up. You got the watch that they make knockoffs off on the museum steps in New York. You got the white slacks. He's looking over here. Guys, this is a football coach. He develops a power run game. It, he looks like the guy you follow on Twitter you went to high school with who tweets, big things come in, and you're like, yeah, right. And then he sells his sock company for $50 million. It's Uber for socks. That's McDaniel right there. And I know you're trying to get it. The all white is a statement. I know you're trying to represent Miami and the culture. Like, how do I say this, Mike? You look like you should be on Scarface's desk. This is an incredible thing he's got going here. And he's looking at Stefanski's just stone cold handsomeness right next to him. That is fantastic, Mike McDaniel. You never disappoint. How about this one? I hate this one. This is, we don't have an in memoriam here. We would never do that. We have the Too Cool for School Award. Guys, there's three coaches missing. Reich, Sirianni, who I expected to be the MVP, mm. and then big old Braves in the parts of the, we don't know where they are. Mm. So I'm just gonna guess, I'm gonna guess, Braves is in the fitness center on the hip sled with a big old hammer dip in. We 30. Sirianni, who's still screaming at the TV about the holding penalty on Bradbury. And Frank Reich is walking Anthony Richardson tape and being like, should we do it? That would be nuts. We got the number one overall pick. I miss Cliff. I miss him a lot. But guys, these are not even here. Let's go back to the main shot. Why did you know? I, are you at the bar? Are you on the phone? Are you talking to rap sheets? Let us know. This is the picture. Is there anything we missed? You're up. Thanks to Anthony Poizel. Thanks to Nick Paulus. I'm Jason Gibbs. Thanks for listening to this edition of Cleveland Browns Daily. We're back with you on Monday. Enjoy the weekend, everybody. This is Cleveland Browns Daily, presented by Ballybet, coming soon to Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland.